Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Russell Korobkin, and uh, one of the great pleasures of serving as dean of the UCLA School of Law is that I get the opportunity to welcome you to events like this, the 2023 Melville B. Nimmer Memorial Lecture with Professor Jack Balkin. Uh, for those of you that are joining us remotely, and I know there are quite a few of you, uh, thank you for being with us. And um, for everyone here tonight, uh, welcome uh, uh, to this uh, fabulous event. Uh, before we continue, I want to acknowledge that UCLA sits on the land of on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Um, as many of you know, the Melville Nimmer Lecture is a mainstay on the UCLA law calendar. Uh, the lecture's been delivered by leading scholars for more than three decades now. Uh, the Nimmer Lecture celebrates the legacy of Mel Nimmer, who was the preeminent copyright scholar of his day, a titan in the field, and a beloved professor at the UCLA School of Law from 1962 until his death in 1985. Mel worked with generations of students, and he made this law school a top institution in intellectual property. The success of our current Ziffrin Institute for Media, Entertainment, Technology, and Sports Law, which sponsors this lecture tonight and ranks year after year as a leading entertainment law program in the country, rests firmly on the sturdy foundation that Mel built. Uh, Mel's impact resonates throughout the law. His success in the 1971 Supreme Court case of Cohen v. California remains a landmark in free speech and First Amendment law. And his signature academic endeavor, Nimmer on Copyright, remains the go-to treatise in copyright law uh, as it was back when he was teaching, as it was when I was a student studying intellectual property, and as it will be, no doubt, for the next generation. Uh, here tonight, uh, we also were joined by mem uh, members of the Nimmer family, including uh, his son David, who's here in person, a longtime lecturer uh, here at UCLA Law, uh, who has also uh, kept the Nimmer tradition going by keeping Nimmer on copyright updated um, and, uh, uh, and, and continuing to be the, the leading source in the field. Uh, so thanks to, to David for that, and thanks to the faculty members of the Nimmer Lecture Committee for their work in making uh, this terrific event possible. So our speaker today is Jack Balkin, as I mentioned. He's the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law and the First Amendment at Yale Law School. Uh, he is also the founder and director of Yale's Information Society Project, an interdisciplinary center that studies law and new information technology. Uh, in addition to that, he also directs the Abrams Institute for Freedom of, of Expression and the Knight Law and Media Program at Yale. Um, he's incredibly busy, and uh, we thank him for making time in his busy schedule to come and be with us today. Uh, uh, Jack is the author of a number of books, a regular contributor in the media on various issues in and around constitutional law. Uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a member of the American Law Institute. Uh, he holds undergraduate uh, and law degrees from Harvard, as well as a PhD from Cambridge University. He clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and practiced law at Cravath, Swain, and Moore. And uh, most importantly, he's a friend to many of the scholars I see in the room today and many of the people joining us online. The topic of today's speech is free speech versus the First Amendment, which zeroes in on a matter at the top of the news and in conversations from the corridors of law schools to the halls of Congress to the tech and business centers of Silicon Valley and Wall Street. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to welcome uh, people to events like this, but but this is one where I have to say I'm particularly excited to act to hear the substance of what Professor Balkan uh, has to say to us today. So uh, again, um, uh, we're honored to have Jack here today to deliver deliver this year's Nimmer lecture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jack Balkan. 
I'm going to get myself arranged, so if you want to keep applauding me, that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a joke, that was a joke guys. That's very funny. You guys are great. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. I have a lot of friends at UCLA, and it's just great to be back here. Thank you to the dean, and thank you to David Nimmerans and your family, and, and to everyone at UCLA for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm very honored. I, uh, you may wonder from the title what this lecture is about. Uh, so when I teach my First Amendment course these days, uh, I tell my students uh, that they're taking a course about freedom of speech. And they're also taking a course about the First Amendment. And the two are not the same thing. Uh, and uh, the difference between freedom of speech and the First Amendment grows with every passing day. Now, of course, uh, the, the, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. But uh, it only protects a subset of freedom of speech. And it only protects it in certain kinds of ways. And it's largely concerned with protecting freedom of speech from government power. But freedom of speech is a political value. It's much broader than the First Amendment. Uh, it's affected by private power. It's affected by public power. It's also affected by technology. It's affected by institutions. Uh, and, is, and it's protected by those things as well as by rights. Uh, so let me just give you a very simple example. Um, let's suppose that we have a town that doesn't have a library. And suddenly we have a library. This affects people's ability to access information it affects their, people, their, uh, their, their practical rights of freedom of expression, their practical ability to speak. Take the internet. The internet did not actually increase any juridical rights, as far as I'm aware. But what it did is it created a brand new set of affordances and possibilities for people to speak, so it increased their, freedom, their practical freedom of speech. And so when I talk about the freedom of speech, I'm not talking about juridical rights, necessarily. I'm not talking about rights against the government. I'm talking about the practical ability to speech, uh, speak to audiences and reach them. <laughs> And I'm also interested in the ways in which that practical ability might be limited, or enhanced, amplified, or demoted. And that's what I mean when I talk about freedom of speech in this lecture. It's a political value which the Constitution partially protects. Now, there are four big ideas in this talk, so I'm going to introduce them to you. And then we're going to go through them one by one, and I want to show you their interconnections. The first big idea is uh, what we might call the pluralist model of speech regulation. It's the kind of speech regulation we have now, in which instead of having just states regulating us, there are all of these different players, uh, infrastructure companies and digital companies that also regulate our practical ability to speak and reach audiences and hear from other people. And, uh, and I uh, uh, basically describe it as a, a triangle, a free speech triangle, as a simplified matter. I'll get to that in a second. So that's the first idea, the pluralist system of speech regulation. The second idea is a mouthful. It's deconstitutionalization. What do I mean by deconstitutionalization? I mean that people try to turn what would have been First Amendment issues or free speech issues into issues of statutes, statutory issues, administrative issues, and technological issues. So if you want to get want an example of deconstitutionalization, this is what happened to economic liberty uh, in the struggle over the New Deal. There was constitutional protection for economic liberty, and then there was a New Deal struggle, and that idea becomes deconstitutionalized. That is, it's no longer a subject of constitutional litigation, but the issues of economic freedom and liberty are very, very important. And they turn out to be fought out through statutory issues, administrative issues, and through the design of technology. And here we have a Joy Fishkin, who's the author of a book, The Anti-Oligarchy -Oligar Constitution, which is about the, uh, the fate of deconstitutionalization of economic liberty in the period after the New Deal. And he points out there are a lot of bad things that happened uh, because, in fact, people forgot the constitutional bases of economic liberty. And that had all sorts of important effects later on in thinking about political economy. Well, I'm not arguing that, in fact, the First Amendment is being deconstitutionalized. I am arguing, however, that in the context of of online speech, we are seeing all sorts of political forces that are engaged in attempting to deconstitutionalize the question of freedom of speech. So it's a partial, not a complete deconstitutionalization. So that's the second idea, deconstitutionalization. Here's the third idea. The third idea is the algorithmic society. Uh, the digital age very quickly becomes the algorithmic society. And what do we mean by the algorithmic society? We mean a society in which uh, public and private entities, whether it's algorithms, 
artificial intelligence and various kinds of automated decision procedures to predict behavior and govern populations. The algorithmic society runs on data. Right? Basically, it involves huge amounts of surveillance and collection of data from people all, in every possible uh, situation and from every possible place. And all of this data is then used to basically make these decision procedures work. You have to train the, uh, the algorithms, you've got to train the AI, and then you've got to use them uh, in the context of making predictions and governing populations. So I like to say um, that um, uh, the algorithmic society is soil and green. For those of you who ever watched the movie with Charlton Heston, soil and green is people. Uh, the algorithmic society runs on the collection of data from people and turns it into tools and techniques of governance of populations. Uh, if you want to see an example uh, of this, the algorithmic society is also, what's the basic idea of the algorithmic society? It's to know all and to predict all, right? Of something that people have always dreamed about from the beginnings of human history, but now seemingly ever closer. Uh, because of the rise of the algorithmic society. Uh, if you want a, an simple example in the news, ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a prediction model. Basically, what it's doing is trying to predict what the next word or series of words will be, given a set of words that have already been produced. And so it's, what it does is it calls enormous amounts of data from all over, and it basically uses it to train a series of models, which are prediction models. So it's just a, one example of the algorithmic society at work. Okay. And here's the fourth and final idea, which I call the free speech values gap. What do I mean by this? What I mean is, it has always been the case that the First Amendment is necessary to the protection of freedom of speech, but not sufficient to the protection of freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. That the freedom of speech and the values that underlie the freedom of speech always outstrip what the First Amendment can provide. And the gap between what the First Amendment offers you and the realization of the values that justify and underlie the First Amendment is the free speech gap. It's always existing. It's not a new thing. But the claim I'm going to make in this talk is that the digital age and the algorithmic society have caused this gap to widen with consequences that are not necessarily very good. And I'll talk a bit about that. It's changing ways, changing ways people think about free speech and different ways that people talk about free speech. These things have changed. They have tended to widen the free speech gap. So to sum up my talk, so you don't have to wait anymore, you can leave. The, the, the pluralist model will lead, it gives incentives for different parties to engage in deconstitutionalization. And the pluralist model and the algorithmic society together widen and exacerbate the gap between what the First Amendment protects and the values that underlie freedom of speech. It widens the free speech gap. That's what I'm going to talk about. Now, as you can tell from what I've just said, this is mostly a description about the things that are happening all around us. I have normative views about how we should regulate social media. Uh, I have an article that I gave a link to for CLE uh, on how to regulate and not regulate social media. I'm happy to talk about that. In the question and answer, I will touch on it at the very end. And, and the Supreme Court today um, had arguments in Google, the Google case, very important case, touching upon some of the things I'm going to say today. I have views about that. If you want to ask me in the question and answer, happy to talk about it. Tomorrow they're going to do another case, Twitter versus Tomna, happy to talk about that. Uh, there are two other cases I'm going to talk about, the net choice cases from Texas and Florida. Again, happy to talk about that in the question and answer. But, Right now, I'm interested in describing the world where we are already in and what it means for the gap between freedom of speech and the First Amendment. So let me start with talking about the pluralist model. The basic idea is this. You can now understand the regulation of speech as having three different sides to it. Actually, it's more complicated than that, but for purposes of this talk, imagine a big triangle. Um, one set of uh, kinds of speech regulations between states and individuals, media organizations, and the like. And it's very familiar. It's what we talk about in the 20th century. It's most of the First Amendment, of course. And I call that old school speech regulation. Old school speech regulation is when the government goes after a speaker or a media and uses criminal, fine, uh, criminal uh, punishments, fines, or penalties. It's old school, right? Um, and, but what's interesting is that 
with the digital age comes a new set of people and institutions that govern speech. These are the owners of privately owned infrastructure. And they go all the way up and down the internet stacks. So you have social media companies, you have search engines, you have uh, web hosting services, you have, uh, you have the domain name system, you have broadband providers, you have defense and caching services, you have the operators of app stores. All of these various players have the ability to govern speech, sometimes very clumsily, sometimes in a more fine-tuned manner. And they are very important in setting the rules for speech online. And the presence of these new players in the governance of speech leads to two, the two other sides of the triangle. The first side of the triangle is what I call the new school of speech regulation, new school of speech regulation. What's that? Well, the amount of speech that's going on online is enormous. And nation states and the European Union lack the capacity to govern it. They just can't. And much of it is, comes from other countries, so they can't govern it if they wanted to, and some of it is anonymous. But basically, the, the scale of it is just enormous. And so as a result, states and the European Union have basically aimed their regulatory fire at the owners of private infrastructure. So new school speech regulation is the state's attempt to coerce or co-opt the owners of private infrastructure to get them to govern speech online in the way that the state wants. Now, most of this new school speech regulation has been designed to get uh, private infrastructure owners to take stuff down. Uh, so for example, the European Union entered into an agreement with the four uh, biggest uh, digital companies uh, to basically promptly take down uh, presumptively unlawful speech within 24 hours. Uh, and the new Digital Services Act has other versions of these requirements to basically create programs by which you identify unlawful speech and then take it down promptly. This is a classic example of new school speech regulation. You're using the infrastructure owners as your private bureaucracy of first choice. Another example is the European right to be forgotten, in which the question is, will Google, uh, will Google delist a particular link that is uh, seen to violate various rights? And the way it's been solved is not that you sue uh, directly, but rather what happens is Google acts as a private bureaucracy. Basically, if you have a problem about delinking something, you go to Google, and then Google decides whether or not it should be delinked. If you don't like what Google does, well, then you can appeal that to the, uh, the, uh, whatever privacy authority you have. But Google basically is your first decider. It's basically a private bureaucracy. So new school speech regulation is about the harnessing of private companies to basically engage in speech regulation on behalf of the state. But there's another side of it which is really very important. And this side is especially characteristic of populist politicians. Bolsonaro in Brazil, and in the United States, populists in the United States. And this is the use of regulation to try to prevent things from being taken down. That is, instead of, prevent, instead of taking things down, you're using the law to prevent them from taking the things down, despite whatever their terms of service are or their content moderation systems, on the grounds that the people who run the private infrastructure can't be trusted. Their values are different than the values of the people. And they are prejudiced against particular kinds of people. This is the argument Bolsonaro made in Brazil. It's the argument that conservative politicians make today in the United States. It's the basis of the Texas and Florida statutes in the death choice cases. This is also a form of new school speech regulation. And there's another element, too, which is the goal here is not just simply to coerce private infrastructure, but to co-opt it, to bring it in. So many of the kinds of decisions that are made are not made simply because there's an order from the government. Rather, there's a constant back and forth between government officials and the owners of private infrastructure, basically to try to co-opt them into what the government's attempting to do. That's new school speech regulation. The third leg of the triangle is the relationship between private infrastructure and the end user, the speaker. This is private governance, and it is what is in the papers every day when people complain about Facebook letting certain things through or taking things down, or they're complaining about Facebook, Instagram being bad for teenage girls, or they're complaining about uh, hate speech or various other kinds of issues. These are issues about private governance, which is the third leg of the triangle. And private governance has just sprung up as a crucial element of policy discussion 
really in the last 10 to 15 years. And now it's not only so important, it's, it's in the news everywhere, but in fact it's developed a whole kind of Kremlinology, right? So that we're actually very interested in what Elon Musk thinks and what he's doing and what his policies are. And we care very much who's in charge at Facebook and you know, what their policies are and who's on top and who's on the bottom. It's a new form of power, a new form of speech governance, which we are now treating in the media and elsewhere as worthy of study in the same way we study what politicians do. Now, it's very important to understand that private governance is not public governance. The kinds of things that a state can do to you is throw you in jail. The state can fine you. The state can take all your wealth away. What can a private governor do? The private governor can uh, basically demote your content. It can amplify your content. It can slow it down. It can remove it. It can remove everything you've ever posted. And it can kick you off for 24 hours so you can cool down, or it can kick you off forever. Basically, those are the remedies available for a private governor. They're very different than the state, what a state does. But what's interesting is the rise of this other form of governance of speech. Now, there is no good analogy to this in world history that I can think of. I can think of some, but the best one and the one that I use to basically amuse my students is medieval Christendom. You see, during medieval Christendom, there was the pope. And the pope had jurisdiction over everyone's soul, including the souls of the European rulers, who were Christian rulers. And then the Christian rulers, in turn, had temporal power, and they resented the, what the pope was doing. So sometimes they would align with the pope, and sometimes they would oppose the pope, and the Holy Roman Empire would get involved. And, and basically, there was this constant struggle between two different forms of power, the temporal power of European rulers, who were Christian kings, and the spiritual power of the Christian church. Catholic Church, which was basically claiming authority over all of them and ruling in a different way. Well, the analogy is not exact, but if you think the analogy is interesting, then Mark Zuckerberg, the, uh, the, uh, the, the head of Meta, is really like Innocent III, uh, the Pope who claimed authority over the entire world. Right? So that's, you know, it's, it's, so that's what's going on. Okay, so that's the, the first idea. So what are the consequences of this new model, this pluralist model of of governance? Well, there are a number of them. First of all, the First Amendment becomes much less important. Why? Well, one is that the First Amendment doesn't apply in most countries around the world. Um, and therefore, countries around the world have different policies. These policies uh, are aimed at the owners of private infrastructure who operate globally. And there are various ways in which countries can adopt uh, policies which will have effect beyond their borders. Uh, that is the subject of another lecture, but uh, very simple examples are uh, uh, the so-called Brussels effect, where decisions by the European Union about the regulation of privacy and speech can have effects in other countries. Other countries, then in turn, can model their own uh, policies on Europe. Right, That happens as well. And also, uh, uh, countries may, in fact, uh, ally with civil society organizations and uh, law enforcement to basically... Uh, refer complaints about violations of the company's terms of service and say you have to take this down because we think that this is in violation of your terms of service. And so instead of directly ordering them under European law, you just say, well, this is your own rule, so you should enforce it. But of course, if you do that, then of course it's taken down everywhere because it's in violation of the terms of service. So one very important thing to understand is that the global nature of the these governors, these private governors, means that the First Amendment will play less of a role. Now, there's another thing that falls immediately from that. As soon as you have platforms and end users, you have conflicting free speech interests. You have the free speech interests of the platforms, and you have the free speech interests of the end users. Because these free speech interests of end users are you know, huge, I mean, there's an enormous number of people who have these free speech interests, it's nevertheless very hard to conceptualize them in the context of the American First Amendment. And the reason why is that it's very hard for the First Amendment, the American First Amendment, to deal with conflicting claims of free speech rights. Now, in other countries, in Europe, for example, well, there are ideas of horizontal effect that might be used to basically apply constitutional norms to private companies. But even in those cases, you would still have to have some kind of framework statute or administrative regulation to balance the competing free speech interests of the, uh, of the private actors, right? Well, the United States, we don't have horizontal effect. 
Uh, that we experimented with PID as a horizontal effect during the 1960s, but by the middle of the 1970s, these ideas essentially went out the window. Uh, so in the United States, uh, if there's a conflict between the free speech claims of the end users and the platform owners, well, at most, one of them will have vindicated First Amendment rights. And just to let you know what I'm going to say later, it's probably going to be the platform owners. The platform owners are going to have First Amendment rights. And the uh, the end users are probably not going to have First Amendment rights. Um, as a result of this fact, that there are these conflicts between the platform owners and the end users, and the fact that the most likely uh, uh, entities that will have First Amendment rights in the American system will be the platform owners, you get a very interesting political incentive. The political incentive on both the left and the right is to remove First Amendment protections from the platform owners. This is the process of deconstitutionalization. In other words, it's precisely because of the conflict that's created by the speech triangle, the conflict between the end users and the speakers, only one of whom can have First Amendment rights, that you get the push on both the left and the right for deconstitutionalization. This is wild, because the left and the right have very different reasons for wanting to deconstitutionalize the rights of platforms. Uh, for conservatives, mostly, it's because they don't trust the liberal culture of Silicon Valley, and they think that uh, Silicon Valley companies are being unfair to the speakers, uh, to end users, especially conservative speakers. On the left, it's mostly because they think that uh, these companies are basically uh, only in it for profits, and they're uh, using their various amplification and content uh, moderation and recommendation systems to cause any number of social problems including increased rates of suicide, mental illness, violence, and, uh, and uh, uh, hate uh, you know, discrimination. We could go on and on and on. But basically, the left's concern is to neutralize the First Amendment claims of the platforms to pursue these goals. The right's claim is to neutralize the First Amendment goals, uh, First Amendment rights of the platforms to pursue a very different set of goals. Well, how in the world would you, in fact, deconstitutionalize the rights of platform owners? And the answer is there are a bunch of different theories that you can use. I'll talk about them right now, very simply. First of all, you could try to argue that the platforms are common carriers. Um, you could combine that with the claim they're public utilities, and public utilities sometimes are common carriers. You could argue that they're public accommodations. You could argue that uh, they're subject to must-carry obligations. Uh, and finally, you could argue that they're... Uh, 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 that their business is affected with the public interest, like broadcasters in the old Red Lion regime. All right? There are all sorts of ways you can do it. They all basically deconstitutionalize the rights of the platform owner. Um, the Texas and Florida statutes in the net, two net choice cases, which the Supreme Court is very likely to take next term, raise examples of conservative legislatures attempting deconstitutionalization strategies uh, in order to protect the rights of journalists and political candidates in Florida's case and end users generally in Texas's case through statutory rights of free speech. So this is also deconstitutional. Now it turns out, I don't have time to talk about it here, both the Texas and the Florida statutes are very badly drafted. And there are lots of problems uh, with them. And if the court takes the case, I suspect there will be many uh, ways in which the attempt at deconstitutionalization will fail. But important to understand is the strategy, why people are being led in this way. And what's interesting is that platforms actually will turn out to have two lines of defense. One line of defense will be the First Amendment, obviously. But the second line of defense will be what's been argued at the Supreme Court today. It's statutory. It's Section 230, that is, intermediary immunity statutes. So what's interesting is that although you would think that there was only one party, one group of people, that is, those defending end user rights, that are going to be pushing for deconstitutionalization, you can also see that in some cases the platforms themselves will think that it's just better for us to take care of these problems through a statute, that is, Section 230, than to have to deal with the mess of raising First Amendment defenses in these cases as well. And the claim I'm trying to make here is just to get you to see how nobody predicted this. Nobody saw it coming. Well, I kind of did in 2004. But anyway, the basic idea is this basic structure of governance, the triangle of free speech, is leading to this strategy of deconstitutionalization. OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is how 
free speech online gets regulated and how different it is from the model of speech regulation that we associate with civil liberties. Now, as soon as you have platforms, really, as soon as you have platforms, you have problems. Because platforms will always be used for purposes for which the designers did not intend. People will always find exploits. They will always find new ways to use the platform. Sometimes they'll be good, sometimes they'll be bad. But this is just a feature of platforms. This existed from the very beginning of uh, internet service. But what's interesting about those, or differentiates those uh, early platforms from what we have today, are problems of speed and scale. Uh, platforms have to process millions and millions and millions of posts and videos per day. And they have to make decisions about which of them are in violation of their terms of service or their community standards. And they take down an astounding number of these posts. So uh, here are some statistics that are probably not up to date. But in the, the second quarter of 2002, Facebook took down 914 million pieces of in, at the same time, YouTube deleted 4 million channels. That's channels, not the videos of the channels. And additionally, 4.4 4 million videos. Uh, in the first quarter of 2002, TikTok removed 102 million videos. Just the, and that's, that's just a percentage of the total amount of content that are moving through these platforms. That's just stuff they took down. Well, if you think about it from this perspective, this if you're going to govern this content, if you're going to govern this kind of expression, you cannot possibly use the juridical model. You cannot use a model of rights. You're going to have to do something that is basically industrial. It has to be done at huge scale, at a huge speed. And so what you get is a new form of governance, which I call algorithmic administration. Why do I call it algorithmic administrative? Well, first of all, you have algorithms that are making probabilistic determinations about, cons uh, about content that is likely to violate terms of service or community standards, backed up by teams of contract laborers who have to make thousands and thousands of decisions a few seconds at a time. And in addition, uh, if you think about it, even if the error rates of these decisions are tiny, this, the, the huge amount of content flowing through these systems means that the actual numbers of mistakes are going to be enormous by, any, by anybody's standard. And so I call it algorithmic administrative because it's not a pure administrative system where you have a bunch of bureaucrats making decisions and therefore you use administrative law. No, you have algorithms making decisions and administrative bureaucrats or basic contract laborers are trying to you know, deal with it in the way that they can. So it's a sort of interesting combination, so I call it algorithmic administrative. And it is a characteristic example of the algorithmic society's work, the way in which the algorithmic society governs at scale and at speed. This is not a system of free speech rights. In fact, if it, uh, if it protects free speech rights at all, it's through affordances rather than through rights. And the fact that content moderation systems are costly and that uh, companies tend to skimp on them. So, and also the fact that people will continue to try to game the system. So as a result, what actually protects free speech online is not a system of rights. It's a system of technological design and inefficiencies and imperfections of that technological design. Um, well, what you get, of course, is a very truncated form of notice and right of appeal. And if you want to see an example of how it works outside the free speech context, then look at eBay. eBay already has such a system. Has anybody ever been involved in a dispute with eBay uh, over, a, 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 over an auction? I have. And basically, it's all done by algorithm. It's all done to basically streamline the process as much as possible. It has nothing in common with the juridical model of how rights would be protected. Um, now, knowing this, uh, nation states and the European Union have said, well, we really need to put some due process protections onto this system. So, for example, the Digital Services Act uh, requires some due process and notice and appeal rights. And the Texas and Florida statutes in net choice attempt to require explanation and some degree of notice and due process. But the really interesting question is whether or not it is practical to do this at the scale in which this content is created in the system. And also, I should just say, 
that the only players who are likely to be able to even approximate the requirements will be the most powerful, largest companies. If you were to apply these rules to smaller companies, you would very quickly find it's impossible, and this would be the creation of a kind of barrier to entry. Next thing I want to talk about. The way in which people talk about freedom of speech changes in this new environment. Um, the new form of discourse is not the old civil rights discourse. It's hygienic, epidemiological, environmental, and probabilistic, which I will abbreviate as HEAP, H-E-E-P, HEAP discourse. Why hygienic? Well, the idea is that you need information hygiene in, these, uh, right, in the system. Why is it epidemiological? It's because the content spreads virally. Right? And you basically trace it and measure it as you would trace and measure the, the, the flow of virus. In fact, people actually compare this in their research. Why is it uh, environmental? Because you think about the environment in which basically all this content is flowing. You think about organizing it. And, and, and in fact, in privacy context, we think about the environmental uh, metaphor all the time. And it's probabilistic because, in fact, all the moderation systems have to work in terms of probabilities. Um, it's all a question of the likely costs and benefits of adopting one particular model of content moderation rather than another. Now, um, let me give you, uh, why did this happen? Well, uh, it's very simple. The simple answer is because we live in the algorithmic society. That's why the form of discourse shifted. The longer answer is complicated and it involves a bunch of overlapping things, which I'll try to explain to you. First of all, um, how many of you, uh, how many of you uh, look at memes on your uh, social media? Anybody have me? Are you? So the idea of the meme, which is actually predates social media and comes from Richard Dawkins talking about uh, bits of culture reproducing in human minds, the idea of memes is everywhere when we think about online speech. And although the meme is understood to be this funny little joke, jokey thing, it actually, you can understand, once you think about memes going viral, and the idea of memes spreading from mind to mind and from place to place, you can, uh, it, you know, you can analogize it to the larger idea, uh, which is that any little bit of culture that could spread virally uh, through social media and among populations could be thought of as a meme. And in fact, that's the original idea of the meme in Dawkins' uh, book. So once you start thinking about uh, free speech as a meme, once you think about free speech from, as I would call it, a meme's point of view, Suddenly, you're in a epidemiological and hygienic model of thinking about speech. You're no longer in a traditional civil liberties model. And in fact, that's the way people talk about speech now. They talk about things going viral. They talk about you know, who gets the most memes, whose memes win. So that's the first point. Actually, and in earlier, I said we should get rid of the marketplace of ideas model, and we should talk about the ecology of memes model. That's a better model for thinking about uh, how speech works. The second reason is that uh, content moderation is inherently about decision costs and error costs at huge scale. It's inherently probabilistic. And so you start to think about uh, free speech as something you go in probabilistic terms. The third reason, and, and it also has to do with the, the, the consequences and effects of speech. They're all about, uh, they're all about probabilities. If we, if we uh, change the algorithm this way, what are the probabilities it'll have this effect? If we change the algorithm that way, what are the probabilities it'll have this effect and so on? It's all probabilistic discussion. Uh, the next idea is that in the algorithmic society, speech and communication are transformed from what you think of as this humanist endeavor of minds communicating with each other about their ideas and opinions in a public sphere of rational deliberation and art into measurable commodities. That is to say, the algorithmic society does not treat speech as special at all. It treats speech and communication as measurable commodities. People are not people who have reasons. People are nodes in a network. And what they produce is not speech. They produce content. The content can be measured. Its flow can be measured. Its direction can be measured. Who, it, uh, who goes from can be measured. All of this can be done in modeling and statistical analyses. And indeed, the whole creation of data science and network analysis as forms of thinking, as forms of research, are premised on the idea that we can rethink what speech is in the context of what is measurable. But wait, there's more. If you think about how social media work, they're interested in who you talk to, so context, they're looking at network. They're interested in what you say, 
But they're especially interested in other behavioral features that can also be measured. Your location, uh, your stated preferences, uh, how fast you move your mouse, for example, if you're working at a computer, uh, your eyes, your face, and many, many other behavioral features, which are not speech, but can also be used and measured and collected and combined to perform what the algorithmic society really cares about, which is the creation of prediction models and prediction products. So that in the algorithmic society, speech is not the humanistic enlightenment conception of individuals creating art and exchanging reasons with each other. It is rather a set of measurable commodities and relationships, which is used for the purpose of prediction. And of course, it's, it, it, you can't read the literatures on uh, the analysis of platform regulation without running into precisely this way of thinking about speech and the way in which it's being measured. And entire you know, research programs are all organized around the conversion of speech into a set of measurable and predictable commodities. Uh, the final thing I want to mention is what follows from this transformation into what I call deep discourse is that the way people are thinking about speech in the algorithmic society is quite different than the way people traditionally used to justify freedom of speech. That is, it's all data. It's all connection. It's all measurement. So when you think about the heap discourse which arises in the algorithmic society, contrasted with the forms of discourse that are characteristic of the civil liberties model of speech. The civil liberties model of speech, which I was taught and which I have taught for many years, does not deny that speech causes harm. It does not deny that speech has a probability of causing harm. But it regards these facts as not relevant to the question of the lines we draw in doctrine for the protection of speech. So the Brandenburg test of speech is not interested in, in discounted probabilities of future harm. It's interested in certainty and immediacy. Other distinctions in First Amendment law, for example, uh, the distinction of actual malice, which is very much in the news these days in the, uh, in the libel law, is not about uh, whether or not something is likely to happen or the probability it will happen or the discounted probability that it will happen. It's about intent. It's about a showing of intent. The distinction between content neutral and content based regulation is not about probabilities. It's not about uh, whether speech is more viral or less viral. It's not about any of the heap discourse. It's about a different set of distinctions. And thus, this civil liberties model is very different than the model of heap discourse. I should just point out two things, very important to understand. The first is that during the 20th century, there were any number of peoples who pushed what I'm calling heap discourse. So in the 19-teens and 20s, people talk about whether speech had a bad tendency. That's probabilistic, epidemiological, environmental. In the 1940s, in Bar and A's, the Supreme Court was presented with a hate speech statute, and the reasoning is very much about what the long-term effects of this kind of speech will be on democratic life and also on uh, possibilities for violence. In the 1950s, in the Dennis case, the court essentially adopted the learned hand test, which is about discounted harm uh, in, in the future, right? Future discounted harm. But what's interesting about the history of 20th century free speech law is that it has defined itself against these ideas. The bad tendency to test was rejected. Beauharnais was treated as an exceptional case, not good law anymore. Dennis was reviled and basically effectively overturned in Brandenburg. And one could tell the story of progress in protection of freedom of speech in terms of the way it rejected this way of thinking about speech. But it's that. That's the first point. Here's the second point. This way of thinking about speech as hygienic, epidemiological, environmental and probabilistic, has always been used to justify why we should have freedom of speech. It's always been used to justify the regulation of things that are not protected speech. Obscenity doctrine is based on the idea that obscenity, over the long term, undermines the coherence of culture, for example, and cause it has bad effects over the long run. So if something is not protected at all, oh, kinds of duties to warn in products liability law, or various uh, issues in securities law, or various issues in, um, uh, in consumer protection law. This kind of discourse is used all the time, but it's not protected speech, and therefore it's perfectly okay to do it. 
And when we talk about using the positive state to build libraries, to build archives, to fund education, we often talk in terms of the long-run consequences of a particular investment in education, in knowledge production, in institutions. We talk about this way all the time. What's interesting about the civil liberties model is that when the state attempts to regulate speech, this form of thinking about speech is off limits. The problem is that most of the fights over content moderation and recommendation systems are about speech that is protected. And the discourse, the heap discourse, in fact, is, how shall I say, going viral. It's the meme of the moment. It's shaping the culture in which we live. Okay. So now let me come to the last set of things I want to talk about. It's the widening of the gap between the justifications for free speech and what free speech actually protects. And luckily, Rick Hasten is here in front of me, and he wrote a book about this, Cheap Speech and What We'll Do. Uh, actually, what is the subtitle of your book, Rick? Uh, Disinformation, Poisons Our Politics and Hygienic. That's a hygienic model right there. Right. Uh, disinformation Poisons Our Politics. Um, so if you think about some, not all, the standard justifications for free expression, there are, for example, that free speech will promote truth. Uh, the promotion, the growth of knowledge, the spread of knowledge. Another is a set of democratic justifications. For example, that freedom of speech will uh, promote and inform public. That's Nickel John. Or that freedom of speech will legitimate the use of public power because people are permitted to express their ideas and opinions and they're allowed to circulate uh, uh, in public discourse. That's Robert Post's view. Or Vince Blasey's view that free speech is a means of checking public power. I would say private power too. But if you think about all of these different theories of freedom of speech, you'll discover that all of them are, uh, that there's an increasing gap between what freedom of speech actually protects in terms of the kind of speech which actually is protected and whether or not that speech actually promotes the particular goals of the promotion of truth, the growth and spread of knowledge, the protection of democracy, the creation of informed public, and the rational deliberation around about uh, ideas. Robert Post has uh, pointed out to me that uh, in the digital world, you don't have, you don't have um, publics, you have crowds. Uh, um, Neil Postman pointed out long before the internet that, uh, that uh, uh, the television had the tendency to reduce politics into entertainment. And I would say that the uh, digital uh, media basically just increased this. They just add to the idea that politics is about entertainment, largely because of the problem of scarcity of attention. And if attention is scarce, how are you, in fact, going to be heard? Well, through spectacle, through repetition, uh, and through various other devices. As this is in your book, Rick, so I, uh, you know. Uh, so in any case, you can see that the, the justifications for free speech, which are premised on a certain way that speech would behave, are increasingly at odds with the actual practices of speech. OK, fine. What are we going to do about it? So here I'm going to close by suggesting that although I've given you a description, I'm also now going to talk a little bit about what you should think about. I don't personally believe that the solution to all these problems is to radically change existing doctrines of First Amendment law. I don't. I don't think, in fact, First Amendment doctrine is the major problem here. I would point to two different issues. One has to do with the structure of information industries, that is, industry structure and business models. And so if you are actually interested in change in this, so there's an article I wrote called To Reform Social Media, Reform Informational Capitalism. And therefore, to the extent I have any concerns about uh, First Amendment doctrine, it's that the way in which First Amendment doctrine is tending might someday prevent the reforms to the structure of the information industries. So that's the way in which I might be concerned about the doctrine. But I don't think the doctrine is the central question. And the second thing I'm very concerned about has nothing to do with doctrine either. It has to do with the relationship between a system of free expression and the institutions for knowledge production, credentialing, and dissemination that go with it. That is to say, to understand a system of free expression, it's not enough that people have the power to speak. There also have to be a bunch of institutions in society which are trusted and trustworthy that are used for the purposes of weighing and considering claims, different kinds of claims both truth claims, knowledge claims, and also moral claims.
that a healthy system of free expression involves both the freedom of expression and these institutions. But what the digital age did, and what the algorithmic society has done, is to weaken all of these institutions and professions. They were designed for a different world. And our challenge today is to create a new set of trusted and trustworthy institutions for knowledge production and dissemination, which are characteristic of this age, not the 20th century. This is going to take a very long time. It won't be solved, I think, by changing First Amendment doctrine fundamentally. Indeed, I don't think First Amendment doctrine is the central question. As I said, the title of this lecture is Free Speech versus the First Amendment. I'm interested in the preservation of the system of free speech. I, have, I think the First Amendment plays an important role in it. But the task that's ahead of us is not about the reform of First Amendment doctrine. The task that's ahead of us is the reform and recreation and invention of a new set of institutions that accompany the practical ability to speak to others. Thank you very much. Very good. Yes. Ten minutes for questions. Please, uh, Cindy has the microphone. Please uh, hand the microphone. And when you uh, uh, ask your question, please do this for me. Please state your name and your favorite meme. And if you don't have a favorite meme, tell me your favorite song. Right. I apologize. <clears throat> I don't have a microphone. I, uh, I thought I would. So if you nope. can speak up with the question, I think we have some aerial mics that'll pick up the question. All right, very good. So please send yes. your name, your favorite meme, or your favorite song. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Hoffman, I do not have a favorite meme, but uh, happy birthday to you is probably my favorite song. <laughs> well, happy birthday to you, Paul. So what is your question for today? Uh, are you familiar with uh, Meta's Oversight Board? Yes, I've heard Which uh, appears to be an effort to deflect um, criticism that they're receiving and, and give some kind of uh, theoretically uh, objective board the right to make the decisions. Yes. And what is your question, sir? Okay. What do you think of that and will it work? And well, it depends on what you want it to do. So the, uh, given the nature of the algorithmic administrative system, the oversight board it cannot possibly um, have a, a, a significant influence on the day-to-day -day decisions of content moderation. They operate at a much higher level by talking about basic policy choices for Meta, uh, policy recommendations which Meta does not have to accept. Uh, they, are, they are based on a juridical model, but as I've said before, a juridical model is just not appropriate for the task of content moderation these days. So it's best to understand the oversight board in terms of what they can do, uh, in terms of what, uh, what uh, people might have imagined that they could do. At most, they are an investigative, uh, uh, investigative organization, uh, a policy recommend, recommending organization at a pretty high level. Uh, they take only a very small number of different uh, questions in a year. Uh, and so you, you just have to understand what they are. Um, they are not a solution to issues of content moderation generally. Uh, they can play an important role, but the role is relatively limited. Yes, sure. I don't have a favorite meme. You have a favorite song, Sean? You know, I really don't like favorites because so much of the world is interesting and fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Shauna has plays no favorites. I try not to, but I would recommend song. the album Discipline by King Crimson, every song on which I think is genius. So what can I do for you today? Well, I wanted to, it, you know, in a friendly spirit, we're in so many of the same places, but I, I wanted to ask you, are you sure the First Amendment doctrine isn't part of the problem in particular? I noticed that when you described the al algorithmic society, you said it runs on a collection of inputs of people. And it sure runs on a question of inputs of people. Oh, inputs of people, yeah. And I think, well, it kind of does indirectly. It's humanly created, but there's a lot of corporate and commercial speech that is not the direct speech of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the problems associated with the data-driven uh, uh, thinking of the problems created uh, uh, in these platforms have something to do with commercialization, as you pointed out. And so I was curious why you think that there isn't a part of First Amendment doctrine we might rethink 
light of some of these problems, namely the favored status of commercial speech, the treatment of corporate speakers, uh, and of advertisements as on a par with the speech that actually participates in the justifications you offered. And so I'm sort of curious why, I don't think it's the entire solution to the problem by any means, but I'm wondering why you don't want to take issue with a major part of First Amendment doctrine. Okay, very good. Actually, I'm closer to your position than you think. So, as I said before, what I'm mostly concerned in is the reform of the information industries. Uh, and if it turns out that commercial speech doctrine expands much further than it currently has expanded, it will be very difficult to engage in certain kinds of regulations that are necessary to basically deal with the problems of the information industry. So, in that sense, you and I are on the same page. I am... Uh, uh, I have been critical of the expansion of commercial speech doctrine since the 1990s. Uh, I didn't want to get into it in this talk, but yes, that is. I'm glad you asked, because that's my view. So, you know, I would, I would do some modest uh, uh, pruning. Uh, but the other area which I'm, I'm quite concerned about is privacy. Uh, because the, the, uh, the doctrines of privacy, as they, re, uh, as they deal with the First Amendment, have actually are really still very limited. As they've only cited a small number of cases, they really haven't thought through the big problems of how privacy affects the First Amendment. Um, and I, I believe that if, in fact, uh, the courts take these cases, so if America ever gets around to passing the Comprehensive Digital Privacy Act, which it never has, uh, and start taking these cases and then use the First Amendment uh, to prevent the, uh, the protection of privacy on the grounds of the First Amendment, yes, that would prevent the kind of reforms that I think about. This is actually part of the reason why in 2015 I proposed the idea of the information fiduciary. I was trying to come up with a way in which to uh, basically shape the way in which the intersection between the First Amendment and privacy law would develop with the idea of the fiduciary obligations as being something which would be consistent with the existing First Amendment doctrine but would allow various kinds of uh, privacy and consumer protection um, uh, laws. But yes, so the answer is you are right. I do have views about these particular areas of doctrine. I do think they're very important. Uh, but much of the literature that I read is about everything. It's like, let's get rid of the Brandenburg rule. Let's get rid of the New York Times versus Sullivan rule. Let's get rid of Gertz versus Robert Welch, and, and so on and so forth. And those things, I think, are not what are, what's central. Uh, there you are. Uh, additional questions. Oh, we have many people now. Yes. Adam Winkler. Yes. My favorite meme is one of Jack Balkan that goes around the internet teaching a class. But you probably is that, is, that, is that a real meme? There is a meme. Now, um, well, I, I, my question is about both the free speech and the First Amendment. Yeah. So uh, to the extent you define free speech as the practical ability to speak and have your voice heard. And to, and to listen to others. And to listen to others. Yeah. I'm not sure that you've identified any problems with our current environment of free speech. We've never been in a world where we've had as much free speech as we have today, as yeah. you've defined it, that yeah. opportunity to be find speech that you're interested in. Uh, you've got these, ver these various four points, which were, uh, but the only real problem that you seem to identify, as far as I saw it, was the problem of platforms using algorithms and making too many mistakes. Um, and such a large number of content will be taken down. But if we think about that relative to all the speech that these contents are promoting, it seems like a, like a very marginal difference, uh, or a very marginal downside. So I'm just curious, like, what do you really see as the problem with our current free speech uh, environment? What is it not doing that it should be doing? Oh, well, the, the problem is the free speech values gap. That is to say, it's not that people can't speak. They, they can speak more than they ever have before. In terms of practical ability to reach audiences and listen to us, it's, it's paradise. The, the point, however, is what justifies freedom of speech? What justifies freedom of speech are a series of values. And the problem is that without the institutions to accompany the technologies, what you get is an increasing divorce between the justifications for free speech and the actual exercise of free speech. That is to say, free speech is supposed to protect democracy. Free speech is, uh, is supposed to protect uh, the spread of truth, the growth and the spread of knowledge. Uh, now, in fact, from the standpoint of uh, Shauna's theory, I don't think the digital age is causing that many problems. From the standpoint of my theory of cultural democracy, probably less, not that many problems, although I think, in fact, that the current system actually undermines cultural democracy as well as the other forms of democracy. But, but from the standpoint of, of truth theories or knowledge theories and democracy theories, the gap, the gap is growing, and that's the problem, you see? 
and that the first and simply saying that the First Amendment is designed to protect these things asks the question: Well, in this world, does it actually does free speech actually perform these functions? And my answer is, it can. It can. It can't do it all by itself. It needs assistance from different industry structures and different kinds of institutions. That's basically my view. In way in the back. Yes, and you are. Very good. Thank you. But I called you by your name. All right, go ahead. Memes, the college of memes. Yeah, know your meme, my friend. So, how is qualitatively, how is what happened over the last 30 years that this has been going on different from what happened with the rise of the printing press and professional publishing? It's very similar. Uh, and in fact, thank you for pointing this out, that in fact the rise of the printing press destroyed existing institutions for curating and, and crediting knowledge. These were institutions that were centered around monasteries. And uh, they understood that the central purpose of knowledge production uh, and dissemination was to promote the true religion. Uh, the printing press destroyed these institutions uh, and, made, and allowed people to route around them. Uh, and it created a complete different culture of, uh, of speech. But that culture eventually developed its own institutions and ways of thinking about knowledge and knowledge production, which were different than the forms of knowledge and knowledge production, the ideas about knowledge that were characteristic of the earlier system. And it took many years for these institutions to come into place. They, they created what uh, Postman calls a sort of literary culture, along as well, uh, it, it, that had a different set of norms and a different set of rules. And they created different kinds of institutions and different, and basically speech entered into commerce and into markets, into early modernity. And it's also the basis of the eventual creation of what Habermas calls the public sphere. Right? So the public sphere couldn't have existed in the preprint world. You know, the preprint world you know, just wasn't available. It just, you couldn't have that social formation. Eventually what happens is the rise of the printing press and the institutions that it spawned eventually make possible, many, many, many years later, the creation of what Habermas identifies as a public sphere. So you are right. Changes in technology can have lasting effects on the way people understand what it is they are doing when they speak to each other, the kinds of institutions they create for speaking to each other and for creating knowledge and conveying knowledge, uh, and uh, the ways in which knowledge is judged and accredited. Changes in technology have effects on all of these things. We are in the very infancy of these new technologies. I mean, basically, I started writing about this in 1999, uh, in a big article in 2004, oh, come on, that's 20 years ago. That's like nothing. If you were to measure in terms of the, the amount of time that, in fact, uh, uh, humanity got adjusted to a literary culture, you see? And as I said before at the very end of my talk, it is crucial to create new kinds of institutions, but those institutions won't spring up overnight. That is the burden of the future. That is what has to happen. And the new culture of knowledge and the new culture of art that will be created will be as different, I think, from the 20th century mass media culture as the literary culture of the 1700s was from the medieval culture. It will be very different. It will be played by a different set of rules. I think that's what's likely to happen. But I can't see it now. I'm, I'm too wedded to a 20th century vision of speech and knowledge. But other people will see it. Yeah, one more yeah, one more question. This had better be a good question. This is the last question. Whenever I get a speech, I always ask the last question. It better be damn good. All right, so yes, in the back. You have courage, sir. What's your name? Thank you. Uh, Joseph Lopez. My favorite meme is Crying Jordan. Um, Very good. I wanted to just kind of touch a bit more on what you had talked about briefly with respect to privacy and the right to be forgotten. Yeah. And I think, to my knowledge, the only statute that really 
I was wondering um, if you are aware of any developments in any other states, or even if there's any appetite at the federal level to maybe pass something that would be comprehensive on a nationwide basis, comparable to what the EU has with the GDPR. The answer is the answer is that digital privacy, comprehensive digital privacy statutes have been introduced um, in the last several Congresses. And, um, and they borrow from European ideas. I am proud to say they also borrow from the fiduciary model that I promoted. And they borrow from a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, so it's not like legislators, uh, legislators in Congress have not been thinking about this. It's just now that the politics in the United States is not... Um, it's not a good time to do anything big like this. It's very hard for uh, members of Congress to do something big like this. They'd have to get bipartisan approval for this. And a digital privacy statute of the kind that would actually be effective will likely trench on lots of people's different interests. Uh, what's interesting about California is that you had a political context in which it was possible to pass such a law, although the California law, even on its own terms, is far more limited than what you would need for a federal digital privacy statute. But People are trying. The ideas are out there. Lots of people have been working this, on this for a long time. And you know, eventually, it will happen. Um, it's just not going to happen overnight. Guys, it was wonderful to get a chance to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And have a wonderful day.